Smoke, that shit take me way back. Talk that shit Welcome like everybody to Trigs Act Show. I'm here with Ellie, Eric, and Brian. Our special guest is Mike Poland, the um scientist in charge of the Yellowstone Volcanic Observatory. I had that written down. I had to look down. <laughs> I didn't want to mess that up. So how this came to be, um, you know, as you know about this show, we've had battle rappers on, hip hop artists, actors, shark experts, but we like to delve into other stuff like this. So I was watching the Science Channel. This show came on. I was like, wow. Wow. Like, let me reach out to Mike, see if we'll come on and talk about what could doom us all as society. And since I was not a great student, I didn't pay attention much in science. I think it's important for me to know what could kill me. So, Mike, before we get into, you know, what's going on with Yellowstone, what you do now, just talk about your upbringing, how you got into your field, if you don't mind. Oh, well, I, I guess I what really got me into this is probably Mount St. Helens in 1980. So I was a kid when that eruption happened, um, living in Northern California. Uh, and it was just something that really captivated me. Um, and sort of as I grew up, I kept coming into contact with this. You know, books were written about it and, and kids' books and that sort of thing. And living in Northern California, we've got Mount Lassen that's not too far away, Mount Shasta. And so my dad and I would go on these camping trips and climb Mount Lassen and see all of the lava rock and things like that. And it just always was kind of there for me. It's something I really wanted to, to learn more about. You know, once I once I got to school, got to college, it sort of was like, yeah, this is this is interesting. I got to do this. It's pretty cool. It's cool that you actually hiked mountains, too. I didn't do anything active when I was nine or ten years old. So I just got fat, quit football and gained weight. It was a fun time for me in middle school at dances. So when you guys were when you were doing this though, as a young kid now uh, with Mount St. Helens, yeah. I always wondered this because there's stories out there and people in New Jersey and on the East Coast have said to me, oh, we saw the ash coming down as far. <laughs> How far did it actually go? It uh, Well, it kind of depends on the, the, the stories, right? So I, this is a, a really interesting um, phenomena, how people really want to, you know, <coughs> pardon me, remember things <coughs> about that event. And, uh, and so I've seen people say to me, you know, I was in Northern California and we had a foot of ash fall on our, on our house. And uh, a foot of ash didn't fall anywhere as a result of that eruption. Um, there might have been, there was a measurable stuff that was downwind sort of Montana um, to the west of, of Mount St. Helens by, for thousands of miles. And it would have affected sunsets. Maybe, maybe there would have been the tiniest dusting in a place like New Jersey. But there are so many stories that we see. Every time Mount St. Helens, the anniversary comes up, May 18th, um, we publish some stories about it on social media and stuff like that. And we'll have people write to us and say, oh, I, I was living in, in, I had one person tell me, I was living in Sacramento at the time and we had a foot of ash. I said, well, and guess what? I was living in Sacramento too. There wasn't any ash. So <laughs> it's it's become a, a stuff of legend, I think. And, uh, and one person, when we sort of pushed back on this, um, it was pretty funny. He contacted his mom and he said, hey, mom, there was a foot of ash, right? And this person was from San Rafael or something like that. And his mom actually replied and said, are you still telling that story? And she said to him, no, there was never any ash, but they moved up to Seattle or someplace like that shortly after. And everyone had stories of ash and he wanted to have stories too. So he started making it up and he he came to believe it. So, geez, that, that kid, you know, lied about a lot. Of growing up. That kid had a Sega Genesis in his bathroom, like everything impossible he had. So, all right, you're a kid, you know, you love volcanoes. You probably hated the movie Dante's Peak and Volcano because they were real. So, I was happy the dog lived in Dante's Peak. That's all that mattered to me. The one lady who pushed the boat across, sacrificial lamb in my eyes. So, when we when we go to you go to college and now you're how do you get the job to work for the government with Yellowstone? How does that whole thing happen? Because I looked at your resume. It's like 15 years of stuff. Just a lot of hard work. It looked like things I'm not capable of. So how, did, how did you? Well, it's, it's not necessarily hard work, right? If you love it. So uh, it, it's a great way to put it. My, my first assignment was at uh, Mount St. Helens. So I, that was kind of a, a special thing to me. I, I got the job of going to work at the Cascades Volcano Observatory right after I finished school. Mm -hmm. And that was sort of a dream come true because I was right next to that volcano that had inspired me. And I got to learn about all these others. And after a few years, I started learning more Then the, an opening came up in Hawaii. And so I was transferred to the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory. And I spent 10 years there. And that was, that was a classroom. That 
experience in, in every way, not just in how the volcano works, but also in how people respond to volcanoes and how we communicate about volcanoes. I had to talk to people whose houses were about to be run over by lava. And it was a, it was a remarkable time to, to sort of understand that the work we did was important. It, it had real value and, and how to talk to people uh, in, in those kinds of settings. And then I was transferred back to the Cascades and shortly thereafter, the person who had the responsibility for Yellowstone, where I'd, I'd done some work, um, he moved on to a new position. And so they were sort of looking for someone to, to fill that void. And I was, I suppose, in the right place at the right time mm. to get that gig. So, uh, yeah, I feel very lucky. I've, I've gotten to work in some amazing volcanic places. And, and now to be based in, in uh, studying Yellowstone is just a, you know, there's just not many other places you can, you, that can beat that. Well, one more question. I promise I'll pass it to Brian or Elliot or Eric. Um, how cutthroat is the business? Because you said like you're right place, right time. Was it like, was there any bitterness against you getting that job? I, I don't think so. I mean, it, well, if, if there is, then my, my colleagues are keeping it from me. Right. Um, it, it's a very collaborative sort of thing. There aren't that many volcanologists. I think there's a lot of competition for getting the job, mm. um, for getting the position, say, with the USGS. There's a lot of young volcanologists that would like to work for the survey because we go to these places and get to study them really up close. And if, if you're into volcanoes, that's you're, you're sort of on the spot. That's a, a really fantastic opportunity. So there's a lot of competition to get into, to say, the USGS or to get an academic position as a professor, that sort of thing. But once you have those positions, it becomes very collaborative. And, and I'd also like to think that even before you have the positions, it's very encouraging. Um, before I landed my job, I had many mentors who helped me along the way, who, you know, really showed me how to become a scientist, how to write, how to communicate, how to do research. Uh, and that's really led me to where I am today. So it's a, it's a really collaborative and, and I think a nice uh, fostering sort of environment. All right. That's not really cool. Um, Ellie, <laughs> Ellie, you're the science. Um, I don't want to say nerd or geek. Cause you can say nerd. It's okay. 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 So, so many questions. Um, how much like seismology does your job include? And like, do you take those, how often are you taking like seismic readings? And mm -hmm. then what do those readings tell you? And then I'm sure obviously being from California, have you worked on the San Andreas fault, Calaveras, you know, all, all that good stuff. Just yeah. yeah so, so my expertise in volcanology is in a field called geodesy. And that's the study of the shape of the earth. Mm -hmm. It's oh, not okay. a particularly well-known field, but I love it. And so what I spend a lot of my time working on is how the ground moves. So when magma, say, intrudes beneath the volcano, when it starts accumulating, the ground will actually inflate like a balloon. Oh. And when that magma drains away, the ground deflates. And so I spend a lot of my time using different types of technology like GPS stations and radar on satellites and things like that to measure how the ground moves and to relate that back to where the magma is and how much there is and where it's going. So it's related to seismology, but that's not my area of expertise. So I typically leave the really detailed seismic stuff to the folks that have the best training in that. And for the Yellowstone stuff, the real experts are at the University of Utah. They've been doing that for, for decades. So I can kind of get by right. with, with seismology. But when it comes to the real detailed work, it's like, no, I leave that to the experts. I'm, I'm going to consult with them when I have really fine, detailed seismology questions. Okay. But I have spent a lot of time on the San Andreas and the Calaveras. Um, uh, I, I go to the Bay Area every now and then to do instrument calibrations. And in fact, uh, we're right on the Calaveras fault when we do those calibrations. Uh, Eric, I saw you uh, doing some studying earlier when you uh, sent me uh, some photos. Yeah. You were watching one of Mike's uh, seminars or speeches. So go on, man. Yeah. So I've got a couple questions. One, it's like when you say you study volcanoes and all of that, I think like the average person has no idea what that actually means. Correct. Like if you're studying like, okay, COVID or cancer or something, we could kind of assume, you know, this is, you know, you're, I don't even know what they do, but they have a beaker, I guess, and they mix some things around. So when you're studying a volcano to someone who doesn't know anything about the field, it's like, you just picture a bunch of people like, yeah, that's pretty hot. Yeah, sure. You know, like, so like, what would be like a test or like what else or, or something that you're trying to figure out and how do you test? Like, what is that process like? I feel, okay, like, so I my, I feel like, I feel like Mike is trying to get our GPAs down pat and it's coming in <laughs> real low right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, why would you know anything about this, right? I mean, it's right, really right. specialized. Yeah. You no, know, I mean, so some of this stuff, it's just I like the study of geodesy. Who's ever heard of that? I hadn't heard of it. 
before I went to my first scientific meeting, which was a geodesy meeting. And right. the, the cab driver said, he's like, what's geodesy? So I, I don't know. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Eric. <laughs> no, so, so you can take some of my, my work specifically um, in that field of geodesy where I'm looking at the shape of the earth. Something that I've really been trying to develop over the last few years is the study of gravity. Now, this sounds totally stupid, right? What do you, gravity, come on. And usually when I say this and I'm, I'm working in the field, somebody will take a pencil or something and drop it and say, oh, see, huh? look, gravity. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Right. Huh. Never heard that before. <laughs> gravity is not a constant. This is something that they tell us in high school and college and so forth, that gravity is the same everywhere. It's not. Mm -hmm. Gravity changes by tiny little amounts Depending on where you are, like if you're really high up on Mount Everest, the gravity is less than if you're in Death Valley, much closer to the center of the earth. Gravity also will vary depending on what's beneath your feet. So if there's a lot of stuff beneath you, like a really dense ore deposit of copper, say, gravity pulls a bit more than if there's not that, there's the stuff beneath you isn't that dense, if there's some sand or something beneath your feet. Well, that also goes with volcanoes. If magma starts to accumulate in a magma chamber, the gravity is going to increase because there's more stuff, there's more mass. Mm -hmm. And if the magma goes away, gravity will decrease because there's less mass, there's less stuff beneath you. So I've been working with some very fine instrumentation to see if we can measure the gravity change at volcanoes to mm -hmm. relate that back to how much magma there is. So that's the kind of thing that I might be doing if I'm studying a volcano is measuring the gravity and trying to understand just how does that relate back to magma? Other wow. people may look at earthquake activity or gas emissions or the style of hot water flow through the surface, but you know, we all have kind of different subfields. So that's the kind of study that I might do, but then you know, my colleague might be measuring gas emissions and trying to relate that back to, to where the magma is. Mm. And when you're studying these things, like, is there someone breathing down your neck, like your boss or somebody like, okay, like, am I like, explain how heavy I am on this? Or like, does it, is it expected that it's going to take forever? You know, like, what, what's the timeline on studies like this? It, it really depends. Um, there's different philosophies on how to, on how to put this information out there. It used to be years ago, um, some scientists believe you really needed to know everything before you wrote it up. You, you published it in some great big tome. Mm -hmm. You know, modern times, people tend to write shorter articles, uh, send them to scientific journals that describe the results of research. And so it's more incremental. But I find that the most important thing is to communicate this. Because, you know, if I go out and measure gravity and have some ideas, it does no one any good if I don't share that, right? Because I'm not going to get feedback, people telling me it's a good idea, it's a bad idea. Have you thought of this? Have you thought of that? I'm not going to inspire perhaps other people that might see what I've done and say, hey, you know, I could use that technique on a volcano that interests me. And I'm not going to find out if I'm wrong. And I think that's something that's, that's really key is more often than not, you'll go out and make a measurement, you'll come up with an idea and say, I think this is what's going on. And guess what? You're probably wrong. And you got it, but you got to throw that idea out there and get the feedback and then refine it. Um, more often than not, I feel like I, I throw out ideas and it's just not, not very good. But by throwing that idea out there and talking with the gas geochemists, talking with the seismologist, we can start to develop a story that fits all of our data sets. And, and that's actually, to me, the excitement of being in volcanology is that sort of meshing together of bringing my data to the table, sitting next to the gas geochemist, sitting next to the seismologist and coming up with a story that fits all of our data. And that can, you know, it's through these kinds of processes that we learn how volcanoes work or how viruses work or how earthquakes yeah. happen, that, that sort of thing. Right, and last question on, on this topic, and then we could pass it along, but have you ever ha like felt so strongly about something and were proven wrong, or you saw someone that felt very strongly and you proved them wrong? And what is that like if that did happen? I, I'm trying to recall if I've ever proven anyone wrong. I don't, I don't, I can't recall the situation where I have, but um, I, when I was at the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory, um, there was a, a very wise volcanologist, somebody I consider a role model who has just seen it all. I mean, he was working at, a, at an incredibly high level before I was even born. And uh, I remember at one point he said, you know, I think there's void space below 
at, we were on working on Kilauea volcano. I think there's void space in the subsurface. And I said, there's no, there's no way, there's no void space down there. And he would, we would did this very publicly in, in sort of one of our scientific forums where he said, well, I think, you know, here's the reason, well, I don't believe so. Here's my reasons. And then he would refute my reasons. And I refuse, we go back and forth. And then I went out there and I did the gravity measurements, which gravity is one of these things that could detect void space. And guess what? I proved to myself beyond any shadow of a doubt that he's right. There's void space. <laughs> and uh, there were a couple other things like that. At one point, he, he said that he thinks that we shouldn't discount the possibility of a certain type of eruption. And I was like, no, that's not going to happen. And here's why. And mm. exactly the kind of eruption that he sort of anticipated came to pass. And I was left going, okay, what don't I understand about this? I learned a tremendous amount from that, but I, I started telling stories to my colleagues that, uh, the rule, rule number one is that the scientist's name was Don. Don is always right. Mm. Rule number two is if you think Don is wrong, refer back to rule number one. <laughs> yeah. The Don of volcanoes, I hope he's called now. Yeah. yeah. That's excellent. <laughs> I'm later, that. Mike got Don fired for swiping <laughs> off his supplies. <laughs> because yeah. Nobody proves me wrong. <laughs> oh, <laughs> my God. All right. I got a, I have a couple questions, but the first thing I want to ask is how many active volcanoes are on earth Ooh. somewhere in the neighborhood of 1500 mm -hmm. those are the ones that are mostly above water there are more below water but those are very difficult to count because they're often not the typical you know pointy mountains that we've sort of come to think of as volcanoes but yeah on round number about 1500 okay now out of those 1500 how often are they having like, I know, obviously, like a significant eruption would be televised. It'd be a big yeah. thing. But like, how often are they erupting where it's not like an explosion? More often than you might think. And this is something that that uh, is one of those misconceptions that's around there a lot. I, I hear this quite often. People saying, it seems like volcanoes are becoming more active. Hmm. Um, and what happens is it's sort of something that's driven by the media. You have an eruption, say, in uh, Iceland. And that brings some attention to eruptions because it's spectacular and people are going there. And then there's a, a minor eruption in some other place that otherwise wouldn't get any attention. But hey, because people are aware of volcanoes and it's in the news, this eruption in Vanuatu gets some attention. And so it sort of it comes a kind of a feedback thing. Typically, at any given time, there are 40 to 50 volcanoes erupting on Earth. Mm -hmm. Most of them you don't hear about. There's 40 or 50 volcanoes right now that are erupting. Most don't make the news. Um, and any given year, there's 70 or 80 volcanoes that erupt at one time or another. So Earth is a pretty volcanically active place. A lot of these you don't hear about because they're sort of always going or happening at a pretty low level. But occasionally we get the real spectacular ones. The Tonga eruption back in January was one of those real spectacular ones that, you know, those ones we talk about for a long time. But there's always go, uh, a couple dozen volcanoes erupting on Earth. Do you think that there's any type of correlation between, I don't want to just say human beings, but all life uh, that damages the Earth and kind of like a pattern between eruptions? Because the magma that's coming up is then forming new rock, correct? Mm -hmm. so it's like new land. It's like almost like it, the Earth is like replenishing itself in a way. Yeah, it's, it's the, the sort of feedbacks are sort of, uh, of interesting. And there's, there's a lot of different levels of those feedbacks, depending on sort of how, how far you want to go. You know, eruptions in Hawaii build new land, right. which, you know, grow the island. At the same time, they weigh the island down. And so over long periods of time, the island is actually sinking because it's heavy and it's pressing <clears throat> down into the ocean floor beneath it. So overall, the island of Hawaii is subsiding, but you get these bursts that add, you know, dozens of acres of land every every so often um what's the well, what's the thing that um i don't want to say like fuels the eruptions but like is it pressure that's built in the earth and it it's just coming out at, it's like picking different spots yeah fundamentally it's it's pressure that's well the fundamental reason for volcanoes to exist are there's heat within the earth and that heat comes from two places one is the decay of radioactive elements, when radioactivity, when uh, radioactive elements decay, they release heat. That's one of the, the byproducts. Uh, and so that heat sort of is a fire that keeps getting stoked in the earth. Um, the other is the residual heat that was left over from when the earth formed 
four and a half billion years ago. That's it's cooling very slowly. So that heat has to get out. And volcanoes are a manifestation of that. Individual eruptions are driven by gases. So magma is very much like a carbonated soda. It's got gas dissolved in it. And as you release the pressure on that, as magma gets closer to the surface, the gas starts to come out, just like opening a soda. And the more gas that comes out, the more it sort of becomes a feedback and it can drive things up very quickly, like shaking a soda and then opening it. So fundamentally, uh, volcanic eruptions are driven by this gas coming out of the, of the magma, just like carbonation comes out of a soda. Mm. My, Mike, is it weird? Not weird. I don't want to use that. We had um, a storm chaser on, Ellie and I talked to from Canada, Mark Robinson, mm -hmm. uh, last August. And one of the questions I had for him was like, just to tiptoe around how you react to these because they are damaging culture they are damaging environment some houses so like when you it's is it a weird profession to like have to not root for the volcano to erupt but like right, right you go know i'm saying like you yeah have to, yeah is it bittersweet kind of like all right this happened great i'm going out to land but i have to watch because this did damage people's lives like how do you approach that yeah it, it's it's absolutely bittersweet because of course these processes are things that we're fascinated by you know if we weren't fascinated by them we wouldn't be doing this this job but then you see how it impacts people. And, right. and that, to me, really came out living in Hawaii. Hmm. Um, you know, we, we would go to people's houses that were about to be overrun by lava. Hmm. As spectacular as it is watching lava, how do you contrast that with standing next to a homeowner who's likely to lose their home as this wall of liquid rock just sort of creeps towards it? Hmm. Um, so it's extremely sobering. We've seen situations where tourists show, and, and I, I think for the most part, uh, the colleagues that I've worked with are very sensitive to that sort of thing because they're part of the community. They live in these communities. Um, but then we've seen tourists who are just, you know, cheering at, at these, these sites. And that's pretty disrespectful, obviously, for, for people that are losing homes, losing, losing their lands. Um, so I, I think what scientists really strive for are what we would call the, the science eruptions. And there's some that are happening at Kilauea right now. They're basically contained within a pit at the summit. So it's just lava that's erupting into a crater. It's not going anywhere. The only impact is from gas emissions that are coming out and they're blowing down wind. And that's not inconsequential, but it's nothing like having your house destroyed by lava. So we love science eruptions where we can learn a lot. We can study it. And it's not really impacting people because then when we learn some things, we can apply those lessons to the big eruptions that, that do impact people. So, yeah, there's a there's a bittersweetness to it. But we love those science eruptions where we know that no one's really getting impacted really significantly. And the lessons we learn can help can help uh, reduce impacts in the future. Now, how before we get to Yellowstone and what's going on under there specifically, just a random question because my mind goes places and I've seen a lot of Hollywood movies. Like if, if you're hanging above lava, how high up would you have to be not to cook? <laughs> like if you're, you know, if I'm on a rope, like how high up so I'm not burning alive? Well, it, it depends on, it depends on how much lava there is. Um, you okay. can definitely feel a, a thin lava flow, something that's, you know, a few inches thick. Uh, several feet away. And, you know, the, it, the classic thing for students to do is to take a hammer and dip it in the lava. And if you do that without wearing gloves, you'll burn all the hair off your hand. Okay. Um, nice. I've also stood on the rim of lava lakes. They're basically these giant, I think the largest one was a few acres in size, pools of lava. I've been maybe 300 feet away and ah. it's warm. It's, it's toasty. Um, and I've had colleagues of mine, for example, the Don of, of volcanoes, as we'll refer to him now, who uh, would tell stories about observing a, a lava fountain. So one of these fire hoses of lava just going straight into the air. And he had he was hundreds of feet away and would pop up to take a picture and could only really stand being up above their little concrete, you know, uh, <clears throat> block area for seconds before they had to duck back down because it just got uncomfortably warm. So none of these things involve cooking, but you could imagine it, it gets uncomfortable. I mean, this is molten rock. It's 2000 degrees. Now, is, it enough like, of it. it's is it like the, like, like cartoons to where you would just melt or like, would you catch fire if you touch lava? You know what I mean? 
Well, there have been people that have uh, not, you know, been paying attention and they've they've stepped in in lava. Lava oh. cools very quickly. It's oh, two thousand degrees, and you're bringing it into contact with air that's, you know, what seventy degrees. Mm. So it cools incredibly th- quickly, and around rocks, trees, feet, it cools very quickly. Um, the people that I'm aware that this has happened to have been able to pull themselves out very quickly, but they suffer horrible burns into to those parts of their, their bodies. Um, uh, Cause even the rock, you know, okay. The rock has become cool, but it's still a thousand degrees. Yeah. Um, wow. But it, it's, saw, oh, well, it, it cools really, really fast. I mean, you can walk on this stuff minutes after it's cool. Can you imagine stepping in dog shit and being like, Oh, this is the worst. And then stepping in lava. Yeah. <laughs> If Doesn't I walked in my great. backyard in New Jersey and stepped in volcano, <laughs> stepped in lava, I would be so wow. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. But I think I might challenge my first scientist because I actually saw a documentary, and a guy. Yeah, we cut him off. We don't need this on our show. <laughs> we don't he need was, this. <laughs> he was uh, five inches from the lava, and he was perfectly fine. And he, he was running around saving the world. I mean, it was a documentary with Tommy Lee Jones called, I think, Volcano. Oh, but no, you idiot. <laughs> oh, that documentary. Yeah. Yeah. The most, it was very- the most realistic thing about that one was when the when the professor sent sent the assistant down to go look and she got fried. And H, uh, yep. she didn't deserve that. I think it was in H. Yeah. And H was the or professor. Had- oh, she was. Oh, yeah, sorry. Quick question. Would the roadblocks have worked? You know how they put like the... This the cement would that have worked if you're fighting a volcano? Just future references, just in case. Well, so one thing that uh, wasn't it, it wouldn't the road the roadblocks those Jersey barriers wouldn't have you know melted right hmm. the, that that wouldn't have happened. Um, but that's rock, that's liquid rock behind those barriers. That's pretty. The force behind that is significant. It could have moved those barriers. Oh, and in wow. fact, that's one of the challenges with lava flow diversion, which is a thing. In some places, some communities have to try to experiment with that. The If you try to block things with barriers um, that are mobile, the lava can just move the barriers out of the way. I mean, it's mm. it's the, the forces that are involved here are pretty difficult to 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 fathom. Wow. All right, Mike. Oh, go on, Alex. Okay, so I was I, I was googling you a little bit. Um, so I saw you do you like study gravitational fields and volcanic activity. So I'm assuming does the field the gravitational field change when like there's an eruption or if you know the magma is being absorbed back into the earth or coming out of the earth. And then what does that look like? And how do you like data map that if you will? So yeah, it can change. And so there's two ways to look at this. One is to take your gravity meter and go make a bunch of measurements, you know, around the volcano. And then you come, come back next year and do it again. <laughs> measure at the exact same places and you compare year one to year two and you might see the gravity went down or went up or didn't change or was sort of all over the place and and that's your error um but that can be one way of saying all right how is the gravity field changing and then what's causing that is it magma leaving the system is it water leaving the area because you know that has mass too the other way you do it is you take a single gravimeter and you glue it to the ground basically and you look at how it changes over time and so we've done both of those sorts of things. And we've seen periods where the gravity might increase before an eruption and then go down during the eruption. Um, so there's a couple of different ways to, to approach it. But typically, you would have multiple measurements in time or space. And you would use those to sort of put that story together and see how the area is behaving or how the volcano behaves over time. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Now, yeah. like, um, you're talking to a C student here, right? So... And after you said that we were taught gravity wasn't the same or was the same and it was wrong, I blame my teachers. So I'm going to chalk that up to Mulligan and I could have gotten a B. So in layman's term here, because once again, I'm here, what is happening in Yellowstone in layman's term? Yellowstone, I, I like to just say when these, you know, I, I get a lot of questions about earthquakes or geyser eruptions or whatnot. This is Yellowstone being Yellowstone. Okay. It is an incredibly active place. There is a magma body beneath the surface. We know that. We've seen it. We've used seismic waves to sort of do an MRI of the subsurface. And you can see that there's a magma body there. It's mostly solid. Mm-hmm. It's hot, but it's mostly solid. But that is the thermal engine that heats the water that then shows up 
uh, in, in geysers and hot springs and those really colorful uh, pools that are all over Yellowstone. There's also earthquakes galore. There are thousands of earthquakes that happen at Yellowstone every year. Most of them are too small to feel, magnitude zero, one, two, that sort of range. That's happening because it's weak, it's hot. There's water moving everywhere. There's water all over the place. And that sort of lubricates the, the systems. And there's faults everywhere. If you look just south of Yellowstone, the Grand Tetons are there, right? The Grand Tetons sit on a huge fault that goes right into Yellowstone. Okay. There are faults all over the place. So you combine the weakness from all that thermal energy, the water moving around all over the place, and all those faults that already exist, you're going to get earthquakes galore. It's just a recipe for earthquakes. And then the ground at Yellowstone moves up and down too. This is partly because of magma that's maybe moving around a little bit in the subsurface, but also because of all that water moving around in the subsurface. We've seen evidence that both magma and water can cause the ground to go up and go down. Hmm. So this is how Yellowstone behaves. Now it gets, it gets, pardon the expression, blown out of proportion. <laughs> with people thinking that any earthquake anywhere nearby means that the thing's about to erupt. Right. Yellowstone hasn't erupted in 70,000 years. And that was a lava flow. Mm -hmm. And that's the most common form of activity at Yellowstone, lava flows, not humongous explosions. The last humongous explosion happened over 600,000 years ago. And the magma system being mostly solid, right now it doesn't have the, the oomph to supply that kind of thing. So people ask me like, you know, when's Yellowstone going to erupt? I, it's not something I'm going to have to worry about, a big right. explosion. It's just not something I'm, I'm concerned about happening in my lifetime because awesome. the ingredients aren't there. So what's the big, like... Yeah, um, everyone well, makes such a big right. deal out of it. Like everybody that speaks about it, like... I listen to Joe Rogan a lot. Every time they bring up anything about you know, so he's like, "Oh, it's gonna, it's gonna blow up. It's gonna kill everyone. It's, <laughs> this is gonna happen." This, this is the one thing everyone knows about Yellowstone, right? It's overdue. Well, right. okay. that's why you're overdue. on the show, Mike. I yeah. want clarification. I want facts. Okay. Yeah. See, this, this is, this is the, you know, there's a lot of reasons that that this kind of thing happens. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you're trying to make a documentary, how are you going to sell it? You're not going to sell it by saying. You know, Yellowstone's had some really impressive eruptions, but it's not going to happen because there's no evidence that there's there's even that potential right now, right? You don't do that in a documentary. I was just on a document. Maybe it was the one you were referring to earlier. Um, and uh, it was a Discovery Channel thing, I think. And, yeah, yeah. and they said they wanted this to be a follow-on to like the super volcano stuff of the early 2000s. They wanted to tell all the new information. And I said, that's fine. I'm, I'm happy to, to help. But you know, we should be realistic with this, right? We need to talk about how we've been able to image the magma chamber. We can see it's mostly solid. We know more about the eruptive history and so forth. That and they said, yeah, sell the show, yeah. Mike, that's well, it, well that's what I'm they said. Bored. That's what we're going to do. And you know what the title of the show was? American Doomsday. Of course. Yeah. Dude, you remind me, you remind me of uh, da da Dr. David Shipman is a shark expert we have on. And he is like you, but then sharks. Like he can't stand what Shark Week says what Shark Week has become. I, I don't know why I'm slurring. I only have one fucking drink. I swear to God. So like he he is so mad what Shark Week has become. Don't worry, Mike. Sooner or later there'll be a volcano week on Discovery Channel, and it'll be Mike Tyson punching Mount St. Helens. <laughs> like that's what they do though. So like it's it's got to be frustrating, yeah. though, for you to put your life's work like to, to for, for facts. You want facts. You don't want the bullshit Hollywood show. And they do this stuff. So now I'm mad for you, Mike. I, you, the, one of the things that I think really irritates me the most is that you don't have to make up something about Yellowstone to make it more spectacular. Agreed. Look at yeah. the place. I mean, yeah. the, 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 we call it the, the charismatic megafauna, right? Bears and elk and wolves and That's bison it. galore. The geysers, hot springs with bacteria in it that can live at boiling temperatures. Yes, those um, extremophiles. I extremophiles, know. right? I, you know, the, the story of the extremophiles, you know, the, the enzyme that we use in PCR tests, the tests that detect COVID and other things, that came from Yellowstone. Yeah. That came from a Yellowstone hot spring. It was discovered there in 1966. Yeah. The story of Yellowstone does not need to be buttered up. With it doesn't need the Hollywood just, twist. It doesn't need, it already is its own. Yeah. Yeah. It, it sells itself. 
<laughs> I think I think that goes with everything too, and we always touch on that. That's where the networks are so tone deaf with society. Like like it works for like reality shows and whatever's on, you know, like um whatever you want to say is on Real Housewives. It works with <laughs> the drama with that. But new episode this Thursday, 9 p.m. It, it works with the drama with that stuff, right? But, like, when it comes to just facts, stuff that, let's be honest, I didn't really pay too much attention to in high school or even middle school about because reading out of books didn't really interest me. But seeing it, it's like a whole different perspective. So I don't think they need to have the Hollywood twist. I think stuff like this is as interesting. And people of all ages and, and whatever they're into, they're always going to tune in for stuff like this. I, I think the same way, like just because the odds of Yellowstone erupting in your lifetime are infinitesimally small, basically zero. Does that mean you wouldn't watch a documentary about geysers or about the history of the place or about the, the bison and elk and wolves and all these amazing, I, I, I think, I think it, it uh, what am I trying to, how am I trying to express this? I, I think it sort of assumes the worst of people mm. to, to yeah. pander to that kind yeah. of thing um it, it doesn't give people enough credit for for being smart and engaged and interested in in the natural world i don't think you, you just don't have to sell it <laughs> well, think about think about dinosaurs will never exist in our lifetime probably hopefully not i mean but but <laughs> think definitely, about how, do. definitely but think about how many people it's, are interested in like the facts of the past you'll watch yeah. like I mean, I, I mean, Jurassic Park a movie, obviously, but like that got so many people interested in looking, you know, what really I remember in middle school that like people were like, oh, my God, I want to read about dinosaurs. So I think you're right. They don't we don't need that. The whole like spiel. We don't need American doomsday. That's hilarious. You must have been so hot under the collar when that, that sounds like, it sounds terrible. It sounds like Sharknado or something, if I'm going to be honest. It's like but sidebar and Another guys, documentary. Yeah. yeah. To build up what you said, I mean. You could just say like you could I feel like you could title a documentary extremophiles and that title alone would probably get people right. interested in it, you know, because it's like, OK, what's an extremophile? And oh, this is that's the actual name of these organisms, you know, like I remember learning about those and being like, you know, the ones that live in the vents or that live in, where, you know, the Arctic, which is really cool. And, you know, these neat little tiny organisms that just yeah. thrive in sulfuric acid, basically. And it's like that in itself yeah. is pretty interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I I think I'm I'm not sure if I'm thinking of the same thing that you guys are talking about, but I want to tell you anyway because I think I am. I watched the thing in the there's bacteria that's in the sulfuric acid that will attach itself to tadpoles, mm -hmm. and then get the tadpole to go to the surface and get eaten by a bird because it needs to bond with the bacteria that's in a bird's stomach, and then when the bird shits, it sends. <laughs> The it back and it's like a, a reproductive cycle. I I don't know what you know where <laughs> yeah. that comes from, but I can what believe it. Right? About? I mean, I swear to God, I saw Shut up, Brian, a, a whole half hour person. thing on it. Brian was like the smartest one. Now Mike has him ranked as four. I'm serious. I think Mike's ranking us as far as like intelligence. He said he talked to his dad. Yeah, I talked to these morons on this show. <laughs> There was only one smart girl who knew what xenophiles were. <laughs> so, Mike, how how much are we though? Like, how much if it did happen? Let's let's go Hollywood. You know what the world okay. wants? Go Hollywood. Right. Go Hollywood. Right. I'm in New Jersey. Eric's in New Jersey. So is Brian. Ellie's probably doomed because she's in California. Good riddance. Nice knowing you. So, if this thing ever just went, let's say tomorrow, what's the damage? Okay, so, and this isn't a lava flow, right? Because right? Yes. that's what usually happens when there are eruptions. We're going to go straight for the gusto, oh, yep. the big caldera forming eruption. Oh, well, man. there's sort of, we're learning more about these eruptions. Before, the supposition had been that it was one huge explosion. It happened all at once, right? Mm -hmm. Basically took hours or days to occur. Mm -hmm. There's growing evidence that these are actually not single big events, there are events, multiple events that may happen over years. So instead of having that huge bang over the course of days or weeks or a week, and then it's over, you might have a large eruption, impressively large eruption, and then months of nothing, and then another large eruption, and then years of nothing, and then another larger. That's a possibility. But if you want to just throw it all at once, mm -hmm. it would do a real number on the central part of the U.S., there would be feet of ash 
radiating away, sort of, say, a few hundred miles out from Yellowstone. In sort so, of your, so your time. friend would actually have a real story to tell about a foot of ash hitting his house at yeah. this point. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's pretty likely. That, yeah. would, that would do the trick. Um, but as you got further away, the amount of ash would, would diminish. Um, it's still not intense consequential because even small amounts of ash can have a real effect on things. Agriculture, for example, uh, and it would have an impact on water water supplies, power, it would interfere with, with electricity. So there would be some real consequences. Now, the, the sort of devastation of the landscape would be centered in a few hundred mile area around Yellowstone, but there would be far reaching impacts from this ash that would fall. And then you'd have this tremendous amount of ash that went into the stratosphere along with volcanic gases. Mm. And that would start to reflect sunlight back into space. And so we'd have the whole globe cooling slightly. Mm. And we don't know how much this cooling would be or how long it would last, but it would probably be few degrees on average and it would last for years. And that's based on analogy with, with smaller eruptions that have happened historically that have had this sort of effect. So you'd sort of face this situation with a, a cooler earth uh, that might last for, for a few years. And then this, this sort of devastation that would be centered on the, on the, the Yellowstone area. I think what I'm more interested in, would I live in New Jersey? Would I be okay in New Jersey? Well, you know, you, you're not going to die of ash, but, you know, there's going to be a lot of downstream consequences, right? I mean, if much of the central part of the U.S. is having trouble with agriculture, what are you going to eat? Pizza. People. <laughs> it's soil and green, huh? People. Go on, Brian. Is there, okay, now, how much, I don't know if you know this, but how much thought does the government or government agencies put into situations like these hmm. and what are types of preparations not preparations to like just save their asses but preparations to maybe like try to reverse the effects somehow sooner and mike if i see a red dot on your head right now i will just tell you to stop okay but yeah i got you <laughs> appreciate it <Yeah. laughs> um there aren't any specific plans for yellowstone to erupt, you know, what are we going to do if there's a massive eruption of Yellowstone? There's no plan for how things would, people would react to that. Um, and that's because it's such an unlikely event. Uh, there are plans for smaller eruptions. The Yellowstone Volcano Observatory, we have a response plan, um, just as there are plans for hurricanes or mm. floods or things like that. So investing a lot of time and effort in going after that worst case scenario is sort of misdirected when it comes to an emergency management kind of thing, because what's going to happen? What's going to happen in our lifetimes? I guarantee you multiple category five hurricanes are going to hit the Gulf coast in our lifetimes, multiple ones. I, th there will not be an eruption of Yellowstone. So where do you want to put all of your effort yeah. in responding Great. to crises? You got to put it in ones that are, that, that area where it's, they're likely to happen and have that, that big impact. Now, what would you do if Yellowstone erupted anywhere? I mean, are we talking about trying to, you know, build, I'm, I'm often accused of, you know, yeah, you probably have a bunker to get, <laughs> no, no, I don't. No, you're um, dead just like the rest of us. Yeah. You know, are we going to, you know, have rockets that are going to send us into go live on Mars? No. Um, those kinds of events we're just going to have to adapt to. And frankly, I think this is something humans are very good at. Mm -hmm. We are adaptable. This is something our species has demonstrated time and again. Sometimes we're not great at it. But in general, I think humanity has its ability to adapt to changing situations. So if something like that happens, we would adapt to a new reality. It's not going to be pleasant. I don't think I'd want to be around when it, when it happened because it's going gonna, it's gonna to be lame. But you know, it, it's sort of like the a, a meteor hitting the earth. And do we have a plan for what we're going to do if that happens? No. <laughs> yeah. I saw another documentary on that. <laughs> Bruce Willis. <laughs> Question. Yeah. yeah, we're going to have final thoughts here because uh, I know, Mike, you've been more than... Uh, uh, um, generous. Generous, <laughs> that's it. We were uh, losing thought here. How many drinks have I had? Ellie, Fitt, uh, yeah, wrap it up, Ellie. <laughs> Really quick, I don't know if this is like your area, but can you maybe explain Old Faithful, like one, what causes it, and two, why is it so, you know, regular mm. and scheduled, you know? Like it's like almost just 90 minutes, and then 
where is that hot Good water question. coming from? Is there, how's the water being warm so that it blows? So actually seismologists have put seismic stations all around Old Faithful. And sure. they've used that to kind of map out what it looks like underneath the ground. And there's sort of a reservoir of water. Oh, okay. And out of that reservoir comes like a little pipe, almost like a teapot. And that's where it hits the surface. That's where the geyser cone is. And there's a constant input of heat from below. And there's a constant flux of water through there because there's a, the Yellowstone Plateau is the highest area of the Rockies. And so it gets tremendous amounts of snow and Sure. Rain. So there's a lot of water in the ground. So you've got this situation where there's sort of a, a teapot situation. And as it boils, as, as pressure increases because the, the water heats up and, and boils, it creates sort of some steam head and then it comes out the pot and bang. That's when your geyser eruption happens. And that sort of takes the heat off or takes the pressure off for a while. And the water level goes back down. And in fact, if you look at the, the seismicity, you could actually see the level go down and then start rising again as the boiling happens and the pressure increases. And because that geyser is sort of isolated, there's not a whole lot that's right next to Old Faithful. It has this very repetitive sort of behavior. Geysers that are off on their own tend to be relatively predictable. Geysers that are in groupings where there's all kinds of material, that, that suggests a really complex plumbing system beneath the ground. And those types of geysers tend not to be as predictable. There's some exceptions in both directions, but when you've got these groupings, they tend not to be quite as, as predictable. So yeah, Old Faithful being sort of off on its own with this very well-defined plumbing system. And that's the way we think of it. It's just like the plumbing in a house. Mm -hmm. And one other thing I'll add to this, just like the plumbing in a house, it can break. So uh -huh. let's say you've got old pipes because you live in an old house and the minerals you know, make all the pipes go down to nothing. Eventually the water is going to sort of stop flowing in your house. Well, the same thing happens in geysers. That hot water has a bunch of junk in it. And that will start to precipitate out and close off those conduits. And eventually the geyser may go dead or you'll have an earthquake and that shakes up those pipes and then the geyser will do something else. So as constant as Old Faithful seems, it's still probably only something that's been around at most a few hundred years. And there was a time we know by looking at tree rings from that area where Old Faithful went about 150 years or so without erupting. Oh, wow. And so it's not always faithful. Ah. Uh -huh. For our time frame, since the 1800s, when it was really first described in the scientific literature, yeah, it's been pretty faithful. Although back in the 1870s, it was erupting every 60 minutes. Now it's erupting every 90. Mm. Okay, sorry. One last one. One last one. Hurry up, buddy. When is that volcano dormant versus extinct? Is there like a <laughs> specific time range or is there... Uh, the, this is one of these examples of uh, terminology that's just poorly used, you know, and I'm sure it's the fault of the volcanologists at some level for being too loose with our, with our words. Generally, we think of an active volcano as one that could still erupt in the future. Right. Usually that's applied to a volcano that has erupted at least once within the past 10,000 years or so. Mm -hmm. Volcanoes that haven't erupted in 10,000, 15,000 years are generally thought of to be extinct. They're never going to erupt again. And a dormant volcano is one that's active. It's just not erupting. So something like Mount St. Helens, active and dormant. Okay. Something like Mount Rainier, active and dormant. Something like uh, Mount Jefferson or Mount Washington in Oregon, that's extinct. It's never going to erupt again. Mm. There's a caveat here. I told you at the beginning the last eruption of Yellowstone was 70,000 years ago. C student. Uh, a plus. A. Here's your A. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> 70,000 years ago. So is Yellowstone active or not? Yes. We would consider it active because we know it has an active magmatic system beneath it. So, all right, well, I just violated my own rule in saying that something that's 70, hasn't erupted in 70,000 years, we still consider it active and not extinct. This is what I mean by these words being Right. Squishy. Yeah. So take it how you want. 
All right. Yeah. Uh, like you pretty much, you know, this was awesome, man. Uh, it's, it's a little different than what we normally do. I hope you had a great time. I think we had, we had some fun here. Yeah. I enjoyed chatting with you guys. Thank yeah, you very much. Really, Thank cool. you. Uh, really quick. Where can people catch you? Do you have a Twitter? Do you have an Instagram? I don't know if the government allows that. Cause I work <laughs> them. it's like, stay off. Do not tell people anything. <laughs> We so we do have uh, um, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. It's USGS Volcanoes, all one word. Um, and I'm I'm pretty I I'm not active by name, so you know you can't see that I'm I'm specifically commenting on things. But I I enjoy interacting with people. I love talking volcanoes, so I'm often on Facebook answering questions and stuff. Um, and then we also do monthly updates for right. Yellowstone activities. So I usually try to film something that shows some data and talks about you know some interesting thing. And you can find those on the, we, we post them to um, Twitter and Facebook, USGS Volcanoes. And also we have a, a USGS YouTube channel. We put them there. Um, so there's there's places like that that you can find out. And I'm always happy to chat volcanoes. If people have questions, they can they can email me. And well, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm dubbing you the true exact show volcano <laughs> expert. So if we ever have any questions, I am emailing you. But uh, seriously, thanks for coming on, man. We had a blast. Thank you. My Thank pleasure. You. Good meeting you all.